Hi friends, starting with a little bit of cloud computing humor here. They say you don't really understand something until you can explain it to your grandma, meaning you need to strip away all the things you know already, get rid of the jargon, and assume the person you're talking to knows little to nothing about what you're about to explain. And that's the approach I'm taking in this video, keeping it super simple and easy to grasp, as if I were explaining it to my grandma. So keep watching, let me know how I did in the comments. Amazon Web Services, or AWS. There's a lot of buzz about it today, and it's a really hot skill to have, but what exactly is it? I could tell you it's a comprehensive cloud computing platform that offers scalable solutions, and on and on and on. And I could show you all these hundreds of services available in the AWS console. But if you're an absolute beginner, your eyes are probably going to glaze over. Really, big picture, AWS is a division of Amazon that launched in 2006. That's right. The same place you go to order books and paper towels also has a huge separate part of the business called Amazon Web Services. And according to Gartner, they're the leading cloud provider today, ahead of both Microsoft and Google. So really good skills to have. But still, what is it and why would you use AWS? To explain, let me give you an example. Say I have a company, Terribly Tiny Trees, that sells bonsai trees. And I want to create a website where I can sell those trees. To build this website, I'll need five basic things. First is some computing power. Think of these as your computers or your servers that do the processing required to run the website. Database. This is where you're going to store things like the information about your trees, information about your customers, and so on. Storage. This is slightly different from the database. Here we're talking about storing things like pictures of the trees or marketing documents, videos for the various products you're selling, that kind of thing. Network. This is what allows your customers to connect to the website through the internet, just like they would any other website. And finally, your website needs to be secure, meaning that the data about your customers, their payment information, the order information, and so on, can't be hacked or stolen by nefarious characters. Well, back in the good old days, if you were a company wanting to create a website like this, you'd have to go out and buy computers, buy servers lots of servers in some cases, and make sure that they were up to date with the latest software and patches and so on. These usually sat in a separate server room somewhere at the office, or in some cases under somebody's desk. You'd have to create and configure databases, and in some cases pay licensing fees for each one. You had to make sure there was enough storage space to store your pictures and other files. You had to make sure your servers could all talk to each other and could talk to the outside world, by having your network engineers run a bunch of cables around and update configuration settings. And finally, you needed to do something about security, which usually meant people and software and hardware to ensure everything was safe. And this worked just fine for many years. In fact, a lot of companies are still using this model where everything is on-premises at their location. But the problem is, first, it's very expensive, both in the sense of hardware, having to guess how many servers you need, what kinds, hope you're right, and then having to replace them when they keel over. And then it's also expensive because of the people required to set everything up and maintain it over time. Depending on the size of the site or the software, you might need a small army of people just to keep things running. It's also hard to scale, meaning that if our company, Terribly Tiny Trees, has a huge influx of sales over the holidays, we don't have a way to easily, within minutes or seconds, add more servers to handle that extra traffic which means the site is going to slow down and it might even crash. We'd have to somehow predict how many extra servers we need ahead of time. We have to order them, get them shipped, get them set up, and start sending traffic to them. And what if you have people on the other side of the world trying to connect to your site that sits in the US, let's say? That by itself is going to cause things to be slow. So enter AWS or Amazon Web Services. AWS has data centers in all these regions around the world, currently 25 at the time of this recording. And these are massive centers full of servers and the network cables and everything else that you used to have to set up at your office. To put it another way, we're taking all the stuff and things, yes, those are technical terms, and moving them from our office to the cloud, and specifically to Amazon Web Services. But the best part is that you only pay for what you need and when you need it you're not paying for all of that infrastructure. It's sort of like your utilities. If you think about how those work, electricity or water, you're probably only paying for what you use. So for this month, you're gonna turn on your lights, run your computer, maybe you have a TV, you use water, dishwasher, and so on. And at the end of the month, you'll get a bill from the utility companies saying, here's how much you used and here's how much you owe us. 
Well, in a nutshell, that's how AWS works as well. Rather than having to pay for a bunch of equipment up front and pay a bunch of people to manage that, you effectively just rent the equipment in the cloud and somebody else manages it for you. And that's actually a really big selling point when it comes to moving to the cloud. Okay, but what exactly are we using? Well, AWS is made up of what are called services. There's literally hundreds of these as of today's recording, but there's just a handful that are foundational to everything else. For compute, the foundational service is Elastic Compute Cloud, or EC2. Think of these as your computers in the cloud. For database, there's two major categories. There's relational, where your data is structured into tables, and then non-relational, where you have a more flexible structure. In AWS land, these are going to be the Relational Database Service, or RDS, and DynamoDB. For storage, we have the simple storage service, or S3. Think of this as where you store your images, videos, and other files. For networking, we've got Virtual Private Cloud, or VPC. This is your private network in the cloud. And then for security, the core service here is Identity and Access Management, or IAM. This is where you create and manage users and their permissions. I won't go into more detail here in this video, but be sure to hit that subscribe button so it's easy to find other videos on the channel as we dig into these more. But for each of these services and others, you're going to be billed for what you use, and AWS provides you lots of tools to manage every bit of it, including detailed drill downs of what you're spending and where. So that does it for my 50,000 foot grandmother friendly explanation. Hopefully you found this helpful and you can use it as a foundation to build more advanced AWS skills. Thanks so much for watching.